Welcome to World War I Centennial News, the Doughboy Podcast, episode number 141. The Doughboy Podcast is about what happened 100 years ago, during and after the war that changed the world. Now, it's not only about then, but it's also about now, how World War I is still present in our daily lives in countless ways. But most important, the podcast is about why and how we'll never let the awareness of World War I fall back into the mists of obscurity. So join us as we explore the many facets of World War I, both then and now. I'm Teo Mayer, the Chief Technologist for the Commission and your host. Welcome to the show. Today we have the next installment of our Focus On series. This week we bring you Focus On the Animals of World War I. From draft animals to best friends, and even some truly unusual critters in the trenches, we'll explore the important and even crucial roles that animals played in the war that changed the world. The Doughboy Podcast is sponsored and brought to you by the U.S. World War I Centennial Commission and the Doughboy Foundation, dedicated to remembering those who served in World War I and to building the National World War I Memorial in Washington, D.C. And this week, we have big news about the Memorial Project. A little background. According to their website, the Commission of Fine Arts is a government agency established in 1910. It's charged with advising the federal government and the District of Columbia on matters of design and aesthetics as they affect and preserve the dignity of our nation's capital. The Commission of Fine Arts reviews designs proposed for memorials, coins, medals, new or renovated government buildings, as well as privately owned properties in certain areas of Washington. They are the guardians of Washington's look and feel. And as you might guess, the concept design and creation of the National World War I Memorial in the nation's capital is something that comes under their purview. Well, this past Thursday morning, September 19, 2019, the Commission of Fine Arts, the CFA, officially approved the memorial design after over four years of intense and incredibly dedicated work by our memorial development team. It's a proud and significant moment for the commemoration of the nation's effort and sacrifice in the war that changed the world. And we wanted to share this accomplishment with you. There's an 80-page document that details every aspect of the new World War I memorial, from the creative and schematic design to nuanced details of the materials, stone, and metals that are being used, the lighting, the inscriptions, the plants that are going to grace the park. The document is a wonderful insight into what's coming. And you can have a copy of the document for free by going to www.cc.org forward slash memorial dash design, all lowercase. And if you missed that, the link is in the podcast notes. That's www.cc.org forward slash memorial dash design. Of course, there's still work to be done to get our building permits finalized and finishing up the fundraising. But as I keep telling you, we're very close. And with your help, we've been getting closer still. To all of you that have texted the letters WWI or WW1 to the number 91999 and given us a contribution, thank you. Every time you do that, the hardworking and dedicated men and women that are pulling on the ropes to make this real are reassured their effort is worth it. Give them a big clap on the back. They deserve it. And so do the World War I veterans. Thank you. If you want to talk about the unsung heroes of World War I, you have to give a big shout out to the literally millions of animals that served. The children's book, War Horse, which became an internationally acclaimed stage musical and then a Steven Spielberg feature film, is just one reminder of the service provided by animals during World War I. Even though, as you'll learn in the episode, the story may have been a bit idealized. No matter. Horses and mules were crucial to the war effort at a time when war was just beginning to be mechanized. But no less important were the dogs, the pigeons, and even some wingless and legless creatures. Am I talking about snakes? You just have to listen to find out. So with that as a setup, let's jump into our centennial time machine to explore the roles animals played in the war that changed the world. <laughs> Oh, 
Horses and mules are probably the animals that are most often associated with World War I. Brook USA is a preeminent equine charity, but one of the things that they contributed to the World War I centennial commemoration was their research and curation of a wonderful website on the U.S. World War I Centennial Commission server. This is where they tell the story of horses and mules during World War I. Now, you can find this incredibly rich resource at www.cc.org forward slash horses, all lowercase. The link is in the podcast notes. So if you love animals, and especially if you love horses, you owe it to yourself to check it out. Now, first of all, there were a lot of American horses and mules that deployed over there well before any of our doughboys. Cindy Ruhlman, Brook USA Special Events and Outreach Manager, tells us more. What we know so far is that there were approximately one million horses and mules who were shipped to England and then on to France from the United States during the three years prior to the United States entering World War I. And those animals were used for extremely important tasks, um, such as transporting guns and ammunition to the front lines. Um, they they carried men into battle. They carried wounded men back to safety. They transported food, water, medical supplies, you know, everything imaginable through terribly, terribly difficult situations. These horses and mules faced hard conditions during the war, but sadly often faced even harsher conditions afterwards, prompting the organization's founder, Dorothy Brook, into action. This is Jo Ellen Hayden. She's also with Brook USA. It was founded in Egypt back in the early 1930s. There was a woman named Dorothy Brooke. She was the wife of a British army officer who got stationed in Cairo. And when Dorothy arrived there, she found in the street some terrible looking horses. They were emaciated, lame, in very, very bad condition under terrible working conditions. And she realized some of them bore the brand of the British Army. When the British Army finished with World War I, they sold the animals that they had to the local populace. Some of those animals ended up in Egypt, and they were still alive in the early 1930s, which was rather remarkable given their care. And also, that was somewhat old for a horse at the time. These horses would have been well over 20. Dorothy was very compassionate. She wrote a letter to a major London newspaper, and she decided to have a fundraising campaign. And her idea was to buy these horses from the people who own them now at that time and then bring them back to England to live out their days. And so in the end, she did raise quite a bit of money just based on that one letter that got published in London. She bought up over 5,000 horses. And from that has grown this incredibly large organization that works in the developing world now. Many of the British Army horses actually came from America. But what about the horses and mules that the American Expeditionary Forces deployed? Did they get to come home? Brook USA's Cindy Ruhlman fills us in on that. We only know of 200 animals that got to come home after the war. And for any of your viewers who may have seen the Steven Spielberg movie War Horse or the Broadway play War Horse, yeah, that had a very happy ending, but that, that wasn't reality. These animals were left behind. They were the ones who survived. Um, were usually sold for slaughter, sold uh, for hard labor. And so they ended up in really in worse condition than, than they were when they were in the war. That the, the, the charity that was started as a result of that is still operating today around the world. The website that Brook USA curated is at www.cc.org forward slash horses, and it offers a wealth of additional information for our listeners that are passionate about horses and equines in general. Joe Ellen fills us in on some of the things that you're going to find on the site. So we're trying to show what their lives were like when they were there, what kind of work they did, how the shipping was handled across the ocean, what kind of harness and saddlery they wore, how they were trained for war, um, recovering the veterinary corps, 
in the Army and the diseases and injuries that were prevalent, what kind of impact poison gas had on the animals, how they were fed, and how that hay and grain got to France. It was many, many thousands of tons that were shipped. If you can imagine, there was a great deal more hay and grain shipped to France by both the British and the Americans than there was oil. So that tells you right there, these animals were doing far more of the horsepower work in in the most general sense than were motorized vehicles. So then we're going to talk about what happened after the armistice, how these horses were disposed of, because that is, in fact, what happened. They were sold in place. And then we go into also some more general information about horses and mules, about their temperaments, why they act the way they do, how they experience the world as animals. Uh, This is not something we're making up. This is really well-known horsemanship. And then some information about things like the mud, the the mud that was so prevalent in France. Why was it there? And it particularly, of course, impacted animals that were trying to pull things through the mud, sometimes falling into shell holes that were filled with water and immediately being up to their bellies or even higher in that mud and how difficult it was to get them out if they fell in. Even if this war had taken place even 10 years later, motorized vehicles would have been able to do the work that the horses and the mules did in this war. But that the, the motorized vehicle technology simply was not quite robust enough to handle the conditions in the battlefield. Our sincere thanks to Brook USA and the organization Cindy Rollman and Joe Ellen Hayden for putting together this comprehensive resource about horses and mules in World War I. I don't think you'll find anything else quite like it, and you'll find it by following the link in the podcast notes. We've talked a lot about the significant work of the U.S. Army Signal Corps in World War I, and it's true that the Corps was at the forefront of technology to maintain communication and develop new capabilities, including things like wireless. But that doesn't mean that they abandoned old tried-and-true methods. Not when those methods continued to be reliable and effective. Which brings us to the venerable homing pigeon. Let's face it, pigeons are everywhere. Although they annoy some people, I've personally loved them since I was a kid. I loved feeding them in the cities when we lived in Europe. And I had a special affinity for the one that poop-bombed my mom, walking elegantly down the Champs-Élysées, wearing a big stylish 50s-era black hat. Splat! (laughs) Then we moved to Asia, to Hong Kong in the late 50s, early 60s. And that's when I learned that they were actually quite tasty. (laughs) Okay, back to business. Before we dig into the story of pigeons in World War I, here's some remarkable facts. Pigeons can fly 60 miles an hour, and they can cover 700 miles in a single day. Pretty remarkable considering that planes in World War I only went 100 miles an hour and only had a third of the range at about 225 miles. That's pretty good. 60% as fast and a three times longer range than World War I planes, the pigeon. And even better than our flying humans, homing pigeons can sense the Earth's magnetic field and use it to find their way home from pretty much anywhere. And here's one you probably didn't know. Pigeons are only one of six species of animals that can actually recognize themselves in a mirror. Pigeons can be trained to recognize every letter in the alphabet. The bottom line, pigeons are smart, they've got skills, and they're pretty much all around amazing. And I humbly apologize to the ones that I ate. Journalist Andrew Blackman wrote a book called Pigeons, the fascinating saga of the world's most revered, and reviled bird. Revered and reviled? Well, here's what he says. Well, it's interesting. For the vast majority of human history, they've been revered. Mesopotamians mention them in their cuneiform tablets. They're in Egyptian hieroglyphs. They were seen as fertility symbols. They were the first domesticated bird. They've been used all through human history. Messages were sent up and down the Nile about flood levels, and they've been used during all sorts of wars to help us. Julius Reuters started his news gathering organization on the backs of pigeons. The reviling is actually quite new. It's only since really post-World War II. And it had to do in just an overabundance of pigeons in our cities. It's mostly an Anglo-American thing in terms of reviling them. 
And it happened pretty quickly. The pest control industry reviled them as well in their advertisements. When there was so much cheap food around, an abundance after World War II, the U.S. was in prosperous times. Bob had fell on the ground and you ended up getting a lot more pigeons. So that's how they became reviled. Revered or reviled, from ancient times to the 20th century, armies learned to rely on homing pigeons as messengers. Ancient Persians and Greeks used them. It was a pigeon that first brought news of Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo. During the Franco-Prussian War, it was pigeons that carried messages from an encircled Paris to unoccupied France, establishing the general principle that carrier pigeons make communications possible in duress of circumstance. Which begs the question, how do homing pigeons know where home is? It happens automatically. Homing pigeons are a breed within a species of pigeons, and basically they're bred for their homing instincts. Some are better than others, just like some play soccer better than others. They're imprinted the minute they're there. So when you train them, you take them a block away, a mile away, 10 miles away, eventually up to like 600 miles away if they're racers. And they'll just come back home like a laser-guided missile without stopping for food, water, rest, or anything. I've seen pictures of World War I mobile pigeon coops. They look like houses on wagons or even motorized trucks, which made me curious about how that works. How does a pigeon find home if home is a moving target, right? Blackman explains. That was high tech at the time, frankly, at least in terms of animal breeding. The most important thing to know about them is homers don't go from A to B. Homers go from B back to A. Your Reuters would send messages from one place back to the other, and then you would take the pigeons back, and then you would send them back again with news releases. Same thing with the mobile loss, but somehow the breeders, the pigeon ears, were able to acclimate them so that the loft became their homing spot versus a permanent spot. It's just a really tremendous amount of breeding and training acumen. Okay, so it works, but I still don't really understand how. What I do know is that pigeons are incredibly reliable messengers. Well, messages is a big one, and that's how they were used during the wars. Pigeons, in some ways, are more reliable than any other form of communication in a lot of ways. You don't need electricity, and you don't need like a long, extended cable like during the Great War. You just need a bird and a way to attach a message to its leg. So that's basically what they have been used for, for the most part. B.F. Skinner did experiments with them in terms of recognizing patterns. They can be used for spotting a stranded boat in the middle of the ocean. They're also particularly good at spotting anomalies, like if you were to have a bunch of Capsules coming off an assembly line, they can pick out the one that doesn't look like the others. But sending messages is critical, and that's what they've been doing. And frankly, they're still being used for that. Saddam Hussein used them to send messages during the war, and the insurgents have been using them in the Middle East since then to send messages. They can't be spied on in the same way the electronics can with satellites or listening devices. You know, I'll leave you one story about, I guess, the beauty of pigeons, and it has to do with Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson grew up in Brownsville, which was a really, really tough neighborhood. And he grew up with very little adult supervision. And he was very much trapped in the sense of where he came from. And he developed a hobby, which was working with a certain kind of pigeon called a flight. And flights like to fly in circles and for hours and hours and hours at a time. And so what he would do is he would go onto the roof of the housing he was on, and he would release his birds, and he would watch them fly for hours at a time. And... For him, that was the only sense of freedom he saw or witnessed, was his birds flying freely above him, because he had none of that for himself. And he actually got into boxing when some local kids killed one of his pigeons, and he got furious, and that's kind of how his fighting career started. And I should say, too, that in most cultures, they are still very much revered and appreciated. And literally, the fate of thousands and thousands of soldiers have rest upon the wings of pigeons. Probably the most famous homing pigeon of World War I was Cher Ami, which translated means dear friend. According to the lore, Cher Ami was instrumental in saving the so-called Lost Battalion, nearly 200 men of the 77th Infantry Division who were surrounded by Germans in October of 1918. The story goes that Cher Ami was the last pigeon in the coop as the 77th was being battered by friendly fire. Cher Ami was sent bearing a desperate message to hold fire, suffering several wounds flying through a maelstrom of shells and shrapnel and gunfire. 
Although the Lost Battalion Mythbusters will tell you that the first word about friendly fire on the 77th location got back to headquarters just a few minutes before Cher Ami arrived, by the time the gallant bird made it back behind the American lines, he or she, I've heard both, had lost an eye, been wounded in the breast, and had one leg attached by literally a thread, the same leg that carried the message container. Now, whether she was the first to deliver the whole fire life-saving message or not, grateful soldiers fitted Cher Ami with a wooden leg. The pigeon received the French Croix de Guerre for bravery. When Cher Ami died in 1919, she was probably the most decorated pigeon in history. You can go see Cher Ami today at the Smithsonian National Museum of American History in Washington, D.C., where Cher Ami is perched next to fellow World War I animal hero, Sergeant Stubby which is a very good and clever transition for us to talk about dogs in World War I. While they couldn't compete with pigeons as messengers, dogs were also sometimes used to run messages, primarily from one end of a long trench to the other, or from headquarters to the trenches. Doughboys also sometimes fitted a spool of telephone wire to the dog's back and sent them off to reconnect trenches with headquarters. And of course, terriers were sought after as the most effective rat hunters in the trenches, something they had a chance to do a lot of. But where man's best friend was especially helpful was when it came to his stronger senses of smell and hearing, to sniff out wounded on the battlefield, to detect poison gas before men were aware of it, and to sense incoming shells sooner than men's hearing allowed. The dogs were unofficial soldiers. The U.S. Army Canine Corps wasn't created until the Second World War, but these were the trailblazers. Doughboys were quick to adopt stray dogs, and those strays often repaid their new best friends in life-saving ways. Two of the most famous World War I dogs were Rags and Sergeant Stubby. Rags was a Scotch-Irish terrier found by a private Jimmy Donovan and Sergeant George Hickman outside a Paris cafe. Rags would run messages, but he would also sense incoming shells and would flop down on his side to warn his human friends. He traveled with Donovan until both were gassed during the Meuse-Argonne offensive. Rags was cut badly on his ears and paws and lost one eye during the battle. He returned to the United States to recuperate with Donovan and Hickman, and in spite of the gas leaving him with a nasty cough, lived a long life as a respected war dog. He was buried with military honors in 1936 in Silver Springs, Maryland. Unlike Rags, Stubby was an all-American dog who wandered into an army training camp on the Yale University campus and journeyed to France as a stowaway with his human friend, Private James Conroy. J.C. Jenkins, VP of Fun Academy Motion Pictures, who produced an animated feature film on the life of Sergeant Stubby, tells us more about the story. Stubby was a stray dog who wandered onto the training camp in New Haven, Connecticut, um, onto the training camp of 102nd Infantry Regiment. He was, it was before military dogs, so they taught him how to salute. Uh, he became a little mascot, so whenever, you know, the colonel might come over and say, what's this mutt doing here? He would salute. And so he, he really raised the morale of the soldiers. And when his pack went off to war, he snuck onto the ship, and he actually fought in 17 battles, catching a German spy in the trenches and being promoted to sergeant. He was extremely iconic, leading parades around the country when he came back, meeting three presidents, uh, and even um, having a three-column obituary in the New York Times when he died. Jordan Beck, head of communications at Fun Academy Motion Pictures, and one of the character voices, incidentally, tells us more about the challenges of making the movie and why they decided, wisely in my opinion, not to give Stubby a voice, but have him communicate like a dog would. We're training on the grounds of Yale, and this dog just adopted a soldier named J. Robert Conroy. We have Logan Lerman voicing Conroy and the one who really takes Stubby under his wing. You know, when, when you look at this history and you look at their story, you see that neither one of them would have survived the war without each other. We have Helena Bonham Carter voicing his elder sister, Margaret. Now, we realized early on in our process that we'd written a story that was devoid of a female character. You know, it was really about Stubby and the guys. So going back into our research, we discovered that Conroy was raised in large part by his elder sister, Margaret, 
So we introduced Margaret as a character to help tell the story through letters and journals between her and her brother. And that really helps us in expanding this time or really fleshing out this period in history for kids and frankly for adults who don't understand what the country was like and what the world was like a hundred years ago. And then who better to voice the bon vivant uh, French poilu soldier who's been in the trenches for years before the Americans arrive, but takes Conroy and Stubby under his wing. Who better to voice him than France? his most iconic living actor, Gerard Depardieu. So we have a, a great cast that's really bringing this to life and expanding those black and white photos that we all know into full CGI animated color that the entire family can appreciate and enjoy and learn from. We decided that because this is a historical film, and while it is a, a work of historical fiction, we want to retain as much authenticity as possible. Stubby didn't actually talk in history. So we made the decision that we aren't going to anthropomorphize Stubby to include a voice. Um, so Stubby doesn't talk, but he is very expressive, as dogs are. And really, for Stubby to have done all of those heroic actions in history, he didn't have to say, gas, gas, gas. He developed his own method of communication that the uh, men of the 102nd were able to understand. They could look at Stubby and realize, oh, wow, gas attack incoming, or incoming shells, because he could hear ordnance as, as it was flying through the air. So we wanted to keep that level of authenticity and really uh, allow the, the historical Stubby's method of communication to be part of this animated film. Like Rags, Stubby also suffered wounds and gassing before returning to the States with Conroy. The media loved him, making him a hero. He hobnobbed with presidents, led parades, and became the field mascot for Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., Sergeant Stubby died in Conroy's arms on March 16, 1926. Now, some claimed that dogs like Rags and Stubby were just mere mascots, but the soldiers they served with and whose lives they saved considered them fellows in arms. But even as mascots, the importance of animals to morale can't be overstated, providing much-needed comfort and companionship. Now, speaking of mascots and unusual mascots, there's whiskey and soda. Raoul Luffberry, who flew with the Lafayette Escadrille, was America's first flying ace. He and some fellows liberated two lion cubs from the Paris Zoo. Whiskey and his sister Soda became the beloved mascots of the Lafayette Escadrille. And they also became quite large. Then there's a monkey named Dick, mascot at the training camp at Fort Devens in Massachusetts. The Aussies brought kangaroos to the Middle East, but it was dogs that were the most typical World War I companions. In the aftermath of World War I, dogs found another key role in human service. The first modern school for training guide dogs was founded during World War I in a country that doesn't often get to be the hero in our stories, Germany. World War I caused a whole lot of eye injuries from poison gas, shrapnel, explosion shock, meningitis, and trench hygiene. Tens of thousands of men lost their eyesight. The story goes that one day a doctor witnessed his shepherd interact with a blind soldier in a hospital. Well, a light bulb went off about the potential of dogs to assist men blinded in combat. In 1916, this doctor opened the first guide dog training school in Oldenburg, Germany. From there, guide dog schools proliferated across Germany and according to Dr. Mark Ostermeyer, the school located in Potsdam was highly successful. Ostermeyer wrote that it would, quote, come to have a major influence on establishing the first guide dog school in the United States. That brings the story to a woman named Dorothy Harrison Eustace, who served as a key conduit between the German dog schools and America. In the 1910s and 1920s, Eustace and her husband trained dogs for the Swiss government at their own facility called Fortunate Fields. In 1927, following a visit to Potsdam, she penned a glowing article for the Saturday Evening Post that described the training and provisions for the German shepherds for blind veterans. Quote, because of their extraordinary intelligence and fidelity, wrote Eustace, Germany has chosen her own breed of shepherd dog to help her in the rehabilitation of her war blind. And in the lovely city of Potsdam, she has established a very simple and businesslike school for the training of her dogs as blind leaders. Dorothy's article didn't escape the attention of one Morris Frank, a young man blinded by two unfortunate accidents. 
He traveled from the U.S. to Switzerland, where under Eustace's tutelage, he meshed with a dog named Buddy. Frank and Buddy came back to America and deftly traversed the busy streets of New York City together, demonstrating that guide dogs could do their job even in the most crowded and hectic locations. In 1929, Dorothy Eustace and Morris Frank co-founded The Seeing Eye, the first guide dog school in the United States. And this story is yet another unknown legacy of the war that changed the world. We're going to wrap up our focus on animals in World War I with a story about one of the weirder critters that served in World War I. Leah Tams is a program associate of the University of Mary Washington in Virginia, and she's going to tell us about it. When she was an intern at the Smithsonian National Museum of American History, Leah was researching women's roles in World War I for the museum website and continuously came across stories of animal roles in the war. As an animal lover herself, when I spoke with her in April of 2019, she told us about this legless, wingless World War I service animal. Was it snakes? <laughs> so it's not snakes. It's actually slugs, which I was very surprised when I found out. So the slugs that served in World War I were leopard slugs, also known as great gray slugs. And essentially, they served as mustard gas detectors for American soldiers in the trenches. There was a curator by the name of Paul Barch at the Smithsonian's U.S. National Museum, which is now the National Museum of Natural History. And he kind of discovered this purely by accident. He had some of these slugs at his home one day, and they escaped from the enclosure that they were supposed to be in and got into his furnace room. And when he discovered the slugs in his furnace room, they were acting very distressed Specifically, they were doing some very like odd movements with their tentacles to show their distress. And he kind of thought, oh, okay, that's interesting. And then didn't think about it for a few years until the United States entered World War I in 1917. And he thought, oh, this could actually be pretty useful. So he went back and did some quick experiments to see if the slugs were as sensitive to mustard gas as they were to the fumes in his furnace room. And he discovered that they were extremely sensitive, much more so than humans, and possibly even more sensitive than other animals used for gas detection, like dogs. So he let the U.S. Army know, and then the slugs were sent off to the trenches, and they helped the soldiers by observing the slugs and seeing if they made these very characteristic distressed movements with their tentacles could alert the soldiers that they needed to put their gas masks on before they were exposed to harmful levels of gas. Horses, mules, pigeons, dogs, lions, kangaroos, and slugs. Oh my. These stories of aid and assistance, relief and rescue, comfort and companionship make clear that, as we remember and honor the men and women who fought in World War I, we should never forget the service of the animals that served with them during and after the war that changed the world. And that wraps up episode number 141 of the award-winning World War I Centennial News, the Doughboy Podcast. Thank you for listening. We'd like to thank all the contributors, talented crew, and supporters that have made today's episode possible, including Cindy Rollman and Joe Ellen Hayden from Brook, USA, journalist and author Andrew Blackman, J.C. Jenkins and Jordan Beck from Fun Academy Motion Pictures, Leah Tams from the University of Mary Washington. Thanks to Mac Nelson and Tim Crow, our editing team, Juliet Kowal, the line producer for the show. Dave Kramer for his research and writing. JL Michaud for web support. And I'm Teo Mayer, your producer and host. The U.S. World War I Centennial Commission was authorized by Congress in early 2013 to honor, commemorate, and educate the nation about World War I on the occasion of the centennial of the war. For over a half a decade, the Commission, Commissioners, staff, and our many associates and supporters have labored to inspire a national conversation and awareness about World War I. We've brought the lessons of a hundred years ago to today's educators, their classrooms, and to the public. We've helped to restore World War I memorials in communities of all sizes across the country. 
Now, as the Commission's charter to honor, educate, and commemorate the centennial of World War I has been successfully completed, the full focus of the Commission is turning to its capstone mission to build a national World War I memorial in Washington, D.C., that after a century of being missing in the nation's capital, will finally stand in this important international nexus to honor the memory and sacrifice of the men and women who served this nation during those transformative years of World War I. We want to thank the Commission's founding sponsor, the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, as well as the major contribution of the Star Foundation. The podcast is made possible through the underwriting of the U.S. World War I Centennial Commission and the Doughboy Foundation. Today's episode and a full transcript of the show can be found on our website at www.cc.org forward slash cn. You'll find World War I Centennial News, the Doughboy Podcast, in all the places that you get your podcasts, including on iTunes, Google Play, TuneIn, Spotify, Radio On Demand, even on YouTube, asking Siri or your smart speaker by saying, play WW1 Centennial News Podcast. The Commission's Twitter and Instagram handles are both at WW1CC and we're on Facebook at WW1 Centennial. Thank you for joining us. And don't forget... You can help keep the story alive for America by supporting the memorial, which will stand in our nation's capital for generations to come. Just text the letters WWI or WW1 to the phone number 91999. Your contribution matters. Now give me just a trial kiss, a teeny weeny smack. And if you're disappointed, I'm a sport, I'll give it back. You don't know what you're missing if you've never had a kiss like this. Thank you for listening. So long.